Good evening. Uh, namaste and we are live. Season 2. This is uh, going live on YouTube as well, on the uh, on Leads YouTube channel. Season 2, conversation number 15. And uh, we are privileged to have Amarnath Hari as a guest today. These conversations are brought to you by the Vivekananda Institute for Leadership, Education and Development. It's a unit of the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement. And uh, these conversations hope to bring speakers uh, and uh, people from a wide range of backgrounds, spanning and uh, you know, spanning topics of development, social issues, leadership, culture, heritage, education, and much, much more. Today, we'll be speaking on a topic that we have not actually spoken on during the last over the course of the last 14 conversations, which is leadership and executive function skills. Uh, it's going to be a very short introduction. Amarnath Hari is program director. People Assets Learning Services and is a career coach, mentor and leadership trainer with over three decades of work experience across organizations in Southeast Asia. His current focus and which is going to also be the, you know, the focus around which we're going to be speaking today is on helping youngsters create a strategy for their lives. So uh, welcome, uh, Amarnath. Thank you, Ramesh. Yeah. You know, one of the, well, one of the questions you know I, I've always wanted to ask him you know is that uh, uh, before I got onto this conversation, I looked up I looked up your LinkedIn profile in, in sense I, I didn't look though I I've known you I did not look up the LinkedIn profile till we agreed that we would you know have a conversation. So and I was frankly intrigued by a summary profile and thought you know I, I made the right decision in asking you to come and come on this uh, conversation. Uh, so, so what has it been like, you know, uh, one of the things is being friends with your first and last boss, not very, you know, not something that many people do. Uh, two failed entrepreneurial ventures, I can relate to that. And uh, uh, I can relate to one of that at least, and 30 years of working with people. So what has all of this uh, taught you? And what, what has it made of Amarnath Hari as a person? Uh, Ramesh, uh, you know, I wish to begin this interview by saying, uh, you know, I'm a very average person. And I do not compare myself with some of the stalwarts, with some of the very extraordinary people you have been interviewing on this forum. So with that uh, statement, uh, let me try and answer uh, your question. Um, you know, with, in, in my, my, I earned my first job by answering a quiz show in the presence of uh, a marketing manager who immediately offered me a job. He asked me if I was available. I said yes, and he offered me a job. I, uh, at, at the work site, I met Atul Angrish, uh, my direct boss, and uh, he's from, the, from day one, he was like uh, very impressive because uh, he was extremely straightforward and he gave an uh, impression of supreme strength. He didn't speak much. He sometimes, because we were young, uh, he was cross several times because we made lots of mistakes. Uh, but, you know, if Atul Angri scolded you, uh, if he praised you, you were on seventh heaven. But if he scolded you, you quickly ran to make amends and then you wanted to do something to impress him. And you, you wouldn't feel bad or hurt or offended. So that was the personality he exuded. And uh, uh, till date, uh, I, do, I don't know why I kept up with him, but... It, it appeared, but every ounce of me wanted to keep keep in touch with him. Uh, it was because I, I later on I moved on to Hong Kong and Singapore, and it was me who was doing all the calling. But I didn't mind it at all. Uh, calling from India was expensive, I know. Uh, I called, he always uh, responded, and um, yeah, that's how we kept in touch. Uh, several years later, uh, I met Dr. Ranbir Gupta. Uh, I think the same set of values uh, attracted me towards him. He was straightforward and he was a pillar of strength. Um, another thing I liked about him, which was like a little contrast from my own approach, you know, on day one, he would uh, ideate, day two, he would analyze and day three, he had implemented it. Very fast mover. Uh, but the common thing with Atul Langrish was he was straightforward. He was a pillar of strength. And... Um, I'm, I'm in touch with him till date. Um, I, th I think it would be a you know crime not to be in touch with him. Crime against yourself or myself in this case. So, uh, so uh, 
one one of the things you know the, i'm going to be taking off from one of what you said right now so uh, when you say that somebody is straightforward so what what exactly translates as being straightforward because i think one of the things that we seem to not uh, give great importance to particularly in the uh, corporate culture of today is uh, you know people who are uh, straightforward because being straightforward essentially means that you are being abrasive a little bit of uh, you know aggressive in one sense and all of that uh, you know tends to come through so uh, so what 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 does straightforward translate into in 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 in, in the corporate setting as you understood think, it then and as it uh, yeah. plays out now you know? i think being abrasive being abusive is for those people who have not crafted their communication skills uh, in in the case of these two gentlemen atul angrish and ranveer gupta they chose their words well uh the tone came through and it said look i'm 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 helping you here i'm not insulting you i'm not shaming you that's straight forward for me where the other person is has nothing but you know your benefit in mind so in that context does the old world value of uh, you know praise in public and reprimand in private still hold good or is that something that's i think so yes yeah, very, pa- okay, it's, very much it's, it's not gone past itself by data praise in public rep, uh, you know and chide in uh, private very much um w- one of the things i'm against uh, this, and this i've seen this uh, across asia is our tendency to shame others mm. we shame our children we shame our domestic helpers we shame our partners we shame our friends we see some some of us seem many of us seem to delight in it right. and i have seen that in in western cultures they are very far from shaming in some cultures in india northern india i have seen they don't shame their children but uh, southern india across without any limitation they shame the chinese shame their children the malay shame shame their children okay so since you brought up the chinese and the malays and uh, <laughs> since you you been you know you spent quite some time in those two geographies uh, i just wanted to you know get a feel for what has been the experience and life lessons from living life in the melting point of now i also know that you've uh, lived in delhi you you are from hyderabad you travel melting point of multicultural multilingual milieu of people places and culture so you know this is kind of how, how does how does one survive the culture hot spot Ra- rather the you know the social uh, hot spots how do you, how do you manage all of those uh, multiple things if you are a youngster who is starting off not a big challenge because oh. as a kid you know um, i was speaking telugu at home just within those confines of those walls the moment i stepped out of the main door i was in the hindi world so uh, i don't know how when where but i learned hindi on the fly because you had to to find kids you know to play with um and then uh, for strange reasons my parents sent me to a mostly tamil speaking school the delhi tamil educational associations of delhi six of them so here i was speaking telugu at home hindi on the street and then tamil in the school not speaking exactly but in in that environment mm-hmm. uh so had to learn because they were the majority the majority of people at home were telugu <laughs> 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 on the street were hindi speaking and at school were tamil speaking so yeah i i i i you instinctively conform do you want to conform you don't want to stand out right right but uh, yeah so uh, i'm just coming to that uh, other point you know the i'm just uh, going in uh, the topic of today's discussion is you want to you saying that you you, you want to your current goal is to help ch- children or youngsters strategize their lives you know we are in a world where we are saying you know children have to be allowed to be themselves let them be is a you know is the is the buzzword so how how does how do how do how do you marry the two you want to strategize my understanding of strategize is about you know having a structure discipline doing what needs to be done and all of those things but we we live in a world where we are saying you know allow children to be free allow the, 
we we went through a completely different kind of uh, schooling kind of uh, upbringing where you know uh, discipline was respected uh, and all of those things i don't see any of those things playing out right now you know for example it was okay for a, a teacher you know to give us a little little, a little uh, whack on the back and all of those things i don't think any any teacher can do that now so how do you how do you help children strategize in a world that is so changed i think you can still whack a child without whacking them and i remember this from my one of my earlier schools uh, delhi public school mathura road uh, they didn't whack us but they asked us to get down on all fours with the uh, waist lifted high the weight of our own body used to kill us <laughs> and and nobody whacked you and uh, i did that i did that with my own kids but that would still uh, come under corporal punishment right i mean you, you, you i don't you, know you, there was no beating there was no physical abusing there was no uh, yeah but but i i'm not sure if that can that is even, that can even be practiced in today's schools I and mean, i'm not sure it can be done at i all. don't know about schools but i did it as uh, early as 1994 95 but mm-hmm. my kids make fun of it you know soon they become they became strong <laughs> <laughs> and and they would take off the weight of one hand and say okay i can i can do this you know so i would increase the number of uh, minutes that they had to do it but then um i i thought that was the right thing because um they, you're not beating them you know you don't come across as abusive to, because this, these things stay on in a child's mind for a long time but but, uh, but they but they're punished by the weight of their own bodies Okay. i thought that was a good via media right. but 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 you do subscribe to the view that you know children still need to be uh, disciplined need to be structured need to be told what they if if not really told what they have to do but at least to point it in the right direction because even I, I that think, has become a casualty nowadays as i see it i think where uh, reason stops the physical abuse starts hmm. i think people who lack communication skills or the patience for it those are the people who would resort to a cane now now that you've uh, you know spoken of communication i i'll I'll, i'll make a segue into what uh, because i i think one of the things that you've been doing even for us even with us is that you know, working with us on our communication and and uh, it's a key we all agree that communication is a key ingredient of success but i'm increasingly seeing that it's often given short shrift or ignored uh when when people are you know, when people tell you it's it's okay if you don't know a particular language uh it, it's okay if you know only this particular language in a, in a, in a particular geography uh, as long as uh, and you know what explains this disdain for building communication skills and a love for languages you know when we were younger we had this great love for language my my hindi uh, my love for hindi despite being in southern india meant that i learned hindi very well or 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 for, uh, so how is communication skills because i see you you are very articulate you know all of that how is communication skills help you in your life and career and how how can it help the youngsters today let me give you some uh, moments from my younger uh, you know life right uh, when i was 15 uh, my father went to work for uh, air tanzania and we went to spend uh, you know two months one year and three months in another year and uh, so we became the you know shoppers because it was not very safe to go out so the we kids uh, 15 year old me and a 13 year old brother we stepped out onto the streets to buy milk which is always in short supply we stepped out to buy uh, and and we were soon speaking swahili <laughs> okay <laughs> it's a, it's a need of the hour you know uh, and um, uh th- then uh, I, i when i went to hong kong you know th- there was very little english uh, especially with the man on the street um I, and let me recount a very interesting uh, episode uh, i had my we had our first child and i wasn't very sure of my emotions at that time so i was just wandering around on a particular weekend there was one chinese guard elderly gentleman who was like who would you know we would greet each other just with a loud hoy kind of thing and uh, so i was happy to share this with him but you know i didn't know how so i thought on the spur of the moment uh, i made a sign uh, that you know we had a baby yeah. so i don't know if, if my this can be seen yeah, yeah, see. so i made a baby like this thing 
uh, he took a second, but then he understood. And then he pointed one little finger up. And I took two seconds and then I understood. And I nodded, yes. Right. And, uh, you know, the Chinese like boys as much as Indians do. Right. And so he quickly, uh, you know, fisted up and congratulated me. Right. So communication happened. No, no words were exchanged. He didn't know English. I didn't know Cantonese. But communication happened. So, so if you have the drive to communicate, I think you will communicate. You know, in that uh, uh, Tanzania experience, we got so uh, pally with the milk distributor that, that he left, let us distribute milk on his behalf. Right. And for us kids, it was a right. privilege, right? Um, so um, if you're a survivor and if you're living in multiple cultures, hmm. You have to communicate and you have to communicate happily because you have to make things work. Uh, you have to be careful that you, you know, in a, in, a, in a foreign culture, you're trying to assimilate. So you don't want to offend anyone. So you do your research. You're very curious. You're very cautious. You're very humble. And you're observing like anything. And you're picking up on those small cues. So, for example, in, in, uh, in one particular country, I had a ringtone, uh, which was from a local uh, music band. So if ever it rang in public, people were not alarmed. <laughs> people took it as in the stride. Hmm. Um, uh, and especially if you're an entrepreneur, you are not only a survivor, you are a fighter. And communication skills are your major advantage. I think the only critical weapon that you have in your armory, which uh, it at least lets you get there, get anywhere. So I think I think most people know this, and if they if they're not developing their communication skills, I think I think they are very short sighted, um, or they could be practicing a vow of silence. I don't know, but you have to step out and talk. You have to step out and communicate. Uh, I'm not saying everybody gets on the stage and gets to you know do a public talk, but with your spouse, with your partner, with your child, with your domestic helper. And there are so many facets of communication. You know, I hear a lot, a lot of advice on the net. People say, um, go and watch Hollywood movies to learn communication skills. And, I, and I, I find myself saying, no, you could be more wrong about this. It should be a structured learning. It should be a need-based learning. You, you can't watch Hollywood. Uh, you may understand what's going on. You may understand the movie, but does it really teach you? Um, uh, as a, as a uh, you know, I, I, the University of uh, Chicago, I think, in Illinois, has um, two hour programs there on YouTube. Uh, the professor, I, I heard him out twice, actually. He says that they use writing skills to think. Hmm. Traditionally, people have been told to think and then write. And he prescribes the opposite. He says, write and think along. Because as and when you write, you express your uh, thoughts. And then they are there in front of you, not rolling around in your mind for you to then bump your uh, future thoughts against these and see if there is an, any alignment or there is any push or there is any spark. No, I, I think I quite agree with that because I myself think when I write. You know, I, I found that extremely... Because I think uh, thinking happens at a, at a very rapid pace, whereas writing is a much slower, uh, you know, at a much slower pace. It's more deliberate. deliberate. So when you reduce uh, things to writing, uh, you take time uh, when you put pen to paper or pe pencil to paper. And I think one of the things that you tend to do is to uh, mull over things and you know, uh, run them over before you actually reduce them to writing. I think in that sense, your mind also slows down a little, and therefore that aids thinking at least that's how i see it it may not be technically right but that's how i've always seen it and typically i also you know uh, write while i think and not really think and then write at least, you know. and and i want to add something uh, ramesh um, i always like to say that communication skills are like a carrier wave in mm -hmm. electronics communication engineering it's a carrier wave once you have the communication skills whether you open your mouth or not uh, there are a lot of things, life rides on top of this carrier wave. Right. 
Right, right. Um, I'll just do a little bit of, a, I'll, I'll, I'll make a segue and, you know, move on to uh, leadership training. That's something that you uh, focused on. So, uh, you know, even at, at our own institution, we do not focus on leaders because we don't believe that, you know, leadership as is action is the verb is where we, you know, put our maximum focus on rather than leaders because leaders come and go, but leadership as a, as, as an action oriented, uh, as motivated directional action is something that is uh, universal and can be learned, can be practiced and can be taught. So just wanted your thoughts on that, your own experience in working with people and building their leadership skills, some, how that's played out. I, you know, uh, you know, when we talk about leaders, we usually think about people at the national level. Right. You know, we might think of a Gandhi or a Hitler in various aspects mm. and see their influence over the masses. But self-leadership is something which is not on display. Right. And, and many people engage in self-leadership. I think every, every parent ha has some percentage of leadership that they demonstrate on the home front. Um, they carry it over to the work front. Um, this self-leadership is something you cannot watch. You won't get a chance to watch because it happens mostly in private, happens in thoughts. Um, but self-leadership is something that um, I have been trying to you know, push and speak with people about. Uh, but what is the basis for leadership? Uh, let me throw that question at you or anybody in the audience. What is the basis for leadership? Where, where does it all start? Or what is the first thing you look for when you think what a leader should be? I, I think uh, if I were to answer that question, I think I would start with myself. I think uh, it, it's, uh, leadership begins with understanding your own self and, and then understanding your relationship with others and the multiple roles that each individual plays. I think it begins with a deep understanding of your own self, what motivates you, what drives you, what are your deep passions. I mean, if you do not ask the fundamental question as I see it, who you are, what you do, what you want to do and why you want to do what you want to do. I don't see how leadership can be uh, played out because if you, if you can't lead your own life, it's, I, as I see it, it's impossible for you to be uh, for lack of a better word, leading others. Because even that I feel is a wrong way of looking at it. You don't lead anyone. You don't have, I, I don't believe in these followers and all of those things. I think uh, Professor Sharma is also saying leadership is role-based. So. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, in, in all the definitions out there, in all the thinking that is out there, uh, my own uh, contribution is that whenever there is a demand, for action from you, um, you know, it is. It could be to procure food, to get a job, to push an application through. Uh, I think it's. It, I don't think call it leadership when you jump a, a queue or you steal bread just because you think you you know it's justified to feed your family. The 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 one aspect, one major aspect of leadership that we speak about is how do you lead while keeping your values and your ethics intact. Mm. That is the tough part, right. and and you know it gets more complex because um, when you when you whenever you are in, engaged in self leadership, you know, do you check if you if the, if they're aligned? with your values and with your ethics or with the ethics of another party that you will be you know, crossing paths with. It is, uh, it, it is this which makes it complex. It needs a lot of courage. And I think courage is the major ingredient for uh, leadership. And, and, step, and, and risk taking, because leadership does not go into known territory. Yeah. Most of the time leadership does things the first time. And and what do you what do you what are your weapons or what are your support systems? Your ethics, your values, principles, and its impact on people. Okay. So if, if you're coaching someone, and uh, you know, since we spoke of values, we spoke of so values are something that 
I mean, if they're truly values, it should it should mean something at a deep fundamental level to yourself. So, if what would you tell somebody who says that he he or she has a has certain values that he or she has built, and they align with universal values? Let's assume that as well. And if that if that person finds himself or herself in conflict with the organizational values, so what is the kind of advice that one can give to such a youngster? If, he or she would come to you. Would, would, would you, would you how, how, do, how does one manage that? Kind of a Ramesh, one thing. Uh, we don't teach. Hmm. We coach. Right. Yeah. So we ask a lot of open-ended questions because hmm. ultimately uh, leadership, including self-leadership, is a very, you know, it's a private thing. Hmm. So you can, yeah, right. I, I can't right. teach and they can't learn leadership from me and take it and practice it elsewhere. So, so if I were to understand, you're saying you won't be telling them to do anything, but rather you no, absolutely not. We'll be working with them and exploring, going on that journey right, with them. Right. right. We, right, we right, set up right. some scenarios, mm -hmm. either, you know, let's say it's happened with Mandela mm -hmm. and we, we only know what happened on the outside. So with a few incisive views, you know, and we ask, and we ask a few questions and, and, uh, we ask people to speculate first on known personalities then we when we and it comes to their own side we ask them to engage themselves in a case study in a fictitious environment and then we ask them what their thoughts are and we ask a lot of what when where how questions we don't tell them we can't tell them we don't pretend to tell them Mm, the prescriptive approach never works. Perhaps. Prescriptive yeah. approach for leadership does not work. You might use it for management here and there, but not for leadership. <laughs> but it's such, a temp it's such a tempting thing to say, you know, I've, I've had three decades of experience or four decades of experience. So I know what, what, what's happening here and therefore here is, here is what worked for me. Therefore, it might work for you. Obviously, that doesn't work. So it's something no, that, because mm, mm. the universe has a infinite number of variables. It will mix and match some of them and throw it at you. So right. how can you prepare anyone for leadership? Mm. So, except that except that, you can prepare them by asking a few questions in a, in a, in a controlled environment. So, so what you're you also saying... They can take this from here and then use, a, you know... So, so when, you, when you teach somebody to cook, you don't send the, the, the raw material with them. Right. They, they find the raw material, they know how to cook, and then they do it. So, so if, I, if I'm understanding you right, what you're saying is that even leadership can't be taught. Is that, is that oh, certainly. Right. All the gurus have already said that. Right. Yeah. No, I just want to clarify because I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm also, you know, I'm also playing the devil's advocate here and you know, asking those kind of questions. Uh, so if leadership can't be taught, then leadership has to essentially be an unfolding of one's own potential that lives deep within. If that be true, is it also true that everybody has the potential to become leader or demonstrate leadership? Ah, this was a question asked a long time ago. Can everybody be a leader or are there some chosen leaders? Okay, not, not everyone can't be a leader. <laughs> can they at least demonstrate leadership context? I, think, I, I believe they can. Mm -hmm. I believe they can. Okay. So uh, I, I'll just make another segue and you know move on to I'll, I'll come back to leadership a little bit uh, later because I, I also want to talk about executive function skills. That is another area that you work on and work with people on. So, so what what are the skills that uh, <clears throat> that you typically think are critical for uh, any for any individual in the corporate world today or in any, or in any walk of life for that matter? And how do you think they should be working on those skills? Uh, ex executive function skills, I, you know, I finally landed upon this set of skills and I was so happy I did. Mm -hmm. uh, there was something brewing in my mind uh, all along and I wanted to, you know, I couldn't really put my finger on it. Till I chanced upon it and I seized it with both hands. Uh, executive function skills, uh, Harvard University has done a lot of research on this and it's there on YouTube and uh, TED Talks and everywhere. I'll show you a, a brief uh, five minute video on this as well. So executive function skills is essentially 
uh, it can it can be taught um, to toddlers onwards, and mm-hmm. toddlers, young adults, adults, and this is something uh, which the research says is directly related to productivity mm-hmm. of the of the you know of people. Um, it talks about a lot of expression your ability to analyze your ability to think your ability to regulate yourself it's and it's one of the biggest uh, requirements of an adult is to regulate themselves because they are uh, you know uh, in an environment where they get lots of uh, distractions and lots of uh, um, opportunities to be played wrong and it's self regulation which keeps a lot of people in line whether you are uh, dealing with society or people at home or at the workplace um uh, uh, do you mind if i uh, you know show you that short clip uh, in in this clip they talk about harvard university actually talks about executive function skills as a kind of skills that a uh, air traffic controller demonstrates you know they have all these planes in the air uh, planes uh, uh, landing planes circling planes ready to take off and they do a tremendous job especially when you know weather conditions are inclement it could be rain sleet ice snow dust storms uh, you know low temperatures or very uh, warm temperatures uh, air traffic controller keeps their cool at all times and ensures that all the planes with all their human cargo or uh, actual cargo land off la- uh, take off or land safely and uh, and it's exactly what an adult does you know they have um, parents to look after often uh, definitely children to look after spouse a spouse to care for uh, they have work life there's a you know competitive workplace then they, if you're not lucky god forbid you have a court case um and one or more more people in you know in your immediate network is not healthy so you have healthcare issues you have uh, legal issues you have uh, money issues you have children issues spouse issues <laughs> you name it and 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 the average adult can be embroiled in you know some or all of these uh, issues and how do they keep their sanity how do they keep their thoughts self regulated so those people who cross the line who cross the line into crime so if you'll allow me i will show you a 5 minute clip on executive function skills right yeah uh, can i take uh, control yeah you can let me just there's a chat with people on it uh, yeah I, i can i can ask some of the questions i think there's one question from uh, venkata lakshmamma i just translate that quickly okay uh, what she is asking is that uh, in the school the, this is the the tribal school uh, the vtcl viveka tribal center for learning uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, children who come from the uh, kadu kurba jain kurba that kind of uh, tribal uh, schools one of the things is that particularly the kadukurba students uh, the children i think is the, the issue is that the 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 language does not have a script and uh, she finds it and they 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 are not very keen on uh, writing they don't like writing and all of those things so uh, so how do we even and and while the while she is interested in communicating with them she doesn't really know how to even make an approach how how does she even make an approach to communicate with uh, with uh, such a does uh, does this person uh, know their language can speak it i don't think she knows i don't think, uh, yeah i don't think she knows that and, and yet she wants to communicate obviously and, yeah obviously yeah yeah, yeah. I, i think what what happens is i think the the education itself is in canada so the medium of okay. instruction is kannada so the medium of instruction is kannada the tribal children don't speak any kannada so, yeah right their so, their language is not the same so. so so there's no way of reaching out to them uh, and and uh, they, they don't have a script either and they're not very keen on writing is something that uh, 
so so, uh, so how how innovative uh, can we get and and let me throw it out because i'm not an expert on uh, anyway an expert on dealing with kids who don't speak your language or with whom you don't have a common language what do kids like i would ask some questions like this how can i get them to come, uh, join me or even you know come close to me should i show them a movie should i engage them in play can they learn while they play can i introduce some topics some terms so so we use what kids like to if if you call them to a classroom they may not respond to you but do you think they'll respond to you if you call them to play i think what we can do is we perhaps can have a separate session with you uh, I think Venkat Lakshma, I think we can a separate session with you. I think we can talk about it. Maybe that will become clearer. I think we can... I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, I'm not saying I have solutions, but I can strike right. it. Yeah, I, uh, I think we need to have a separate, uh, yeah, so a separate session. We could include, have a conversation with Venkat Lakshma, which I can present. Right, right. We can engage with each other and we can come out with something. I, I'm not saying I have something straight away to right. as a solution for her. Okay, so uh, let me show you what are executive function skills. Okay, what are executive function skills? Um, as uh, Harvard University likes to use this analogy of an air traffic controller, um, they're helping multiple aircraft take off a land um, safely in both uh, fair weather and extreme conditions. And they're making judgments along you know, three dimensions. Um, X, Y, Z, uh, not only lateral movements, but also, uh, you know, uh, vertical movements of, uh, of their aircraft. Um, uh, so how do, how do, how are we interpreting executive function skills? Uh, in our sessions, we are coaching, uh, young adults, that is, you know, teens from age 13 to age 19. We don't mind if somebody comes in at 20, 21 or is 12, you know, if they are, if, if, if they can participate and, um, have their own takeaways, then we don't mind younger children as, as well. But if we see that they cannot participate, then we'll politely ask them to leave and come back the next year. So uh, some of the uh, topics uh, we coach people on are ethics and values. We always start with that. Uh, we have time management. We have project management. Of course, all these are watered down to a uh, young adult level. Uh, we talk about relationship management. Uh, we talk about quality management. In quality management, we focus on continuous improvement. Then we have money management, which we cover under banking and finance. We have health management. You know, starts anywhere from starts from um, first aid to chronic ailments and how even young adults can make themselves useful from a health perspective. Uh, then we talk about economics. Uh, everybody today is a global citizen. Um, and a, uh, the butterfly effect says that a tiny ripple in one part of the world can have an effect on the rest of the world. So economics, uh, all of us should know economics and study economics. Uh, sales and marketing. Uh, we say that, we like to say that either you are engaged in sales and marketing or somebody else's sales and marketing activities are targeting you. So get to know sales and marketing, uh, get to know strategy, um, definitely get to know the environment. We owe it to our future generations to keep this, sustain this and hand it over to them. And, uh, and lastly, uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, I think the- so This is for teenagers, right? I mean, this is for teenagers, right. yes. Right. The jobs of the uh, future are going to have a lot of entrepreneurial uh, angle to it. They might be full-time or part-time, but entrepreneurship is it. It is. So uh, what we have learned is these skills, uh, you know, if learned early in life, they equip you to take on multiple pressures of adult life. And, you know, you have all, the, you start out with all the tools. Uh, we have had uh, several, we encourage parents to sit in with the uh, adolescents and many parents have afterwards given us feedback that uh, they miss a lot on some of the on, on many of these topics actually. Um, so let me show you. Uh, we have selected twelve. Uh, there are multiple uh, subjects out there on which we would like to talk, but we have selected twelve. And let me show you uh, what we intend to do with it. Uh, 
So when we talk about ethics and values to our adolescents or young adults, we hope that the outcome will be upright citizens. This is a much needed thing uh, in our society these days, especially when I see um, minors driving two wheelers and four wheelers and breaking the law in so many ways. Um, we talk. We talk about time management. Uh, you know, we are. Uh, we hope the outcome will be better planners, uh, optimizers. Uh, we talk about project management, uh, and and we hope that the outcome will be more accountable people, uh, people who can work unsupervised, both at you know when they are at home and when they are by themselves, um, you know, at a hostel or in another city where they are working or studying. Uh, relationship management. Um, we expect them to become network builders. Um, many solutions these days, whether you are in R&D or sales, um, are, are you know the very complex uh, processes, and you need to do that do them uh, in a team. Uh, so at the workplace, it's 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 very very essential that you uh, you know work with a, you build a healthy network. It's useful to you both at uh, on a personal side as well as on the professional side. Uh, when you talk about uh, continuous improvement, uh, you become achievers, especially in areas which you know uh, seems to fox you at first and seems to be difficult or an area of weakness. Uh, you can use continuous uh, the principles of continuous improvement to become uh, achievers. Uh, banking and finance, um, you can become wealth builders. We talk about uh, the power of compounding. We talk about uh, dollar cost averaging. We talk about how uh, if you save even 100 rupees a month, uh, you know, you should be sitting on a very nice corpus. Um, by the time you are 40, that's when most of your expenses will pile up on you. Right. Uh, sales and marketing, uh, we become brand builders, health, uh, we become wellness creators, economics helps us become global citizens. A knowledge of the environment and our duty towards the environment helps us become sustainers. Um, knowing what strategy is and making strategic moves helps us become winners. You don't become winners by chance. Nobody becomes winners by chance. There's always a strategy at work. Entrepreneurship, you become wealth creators for tomorrow. And essentially, this is how we see an adult. Uh, even if they had uh, 20 hands, you know, they would still be shorthanded. Um, and equipped with these tools, I think you have a better chance of scoring successes in multiple areas of life. You might still have some failures. Okay. So my audience... Yeah, I have a counterintuitive question to this. Okay, okay. Uh, that being, you know, I don't think, for, for example, some many of us, maybe most of us in the audience, including me, uh, has not had the the opportunity to uh, you know have some sort of a grounding in any of these things. We went to school, we came back home, wrote our exams, you know, then found jobs for ourselves. We seem to have turned out all right. So uh, so why do you think the present generation needs uh, all of this uh, uh, grounding and fencing at, at the moment? <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> when you say that you turned out all right. Yeah, I'm giving I myself quite, a pat on the back. I, so. I don't know you very much, Ramesh, <laughs> and not no, for a long time, but I'm not sure we all turn out all right, <laughs> if I may risk saying that. Hmm. Uh, we can always be better than our current selves, uh, and there's no limit to that growth. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you take up a commerce degree, you might learn a little bit about uh, banking and finance and commerce and economics and such, but do we have... Are you saying that we have a wholesome education? At some point in our lives, we do moral science, I think mostly in primary school. Yeah. Why doesn't moral science continue into adult life? When yeah, because I, 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 I must make a confession that I used to hate moral science in school. So. Moral science <laughs> plays a role in every aspect of our lives yeah, and but, every but stage I, of our lives. But I somehow, but I, yeah, somehow never you know, related to that uh, class. Because I think because they don't make it interesting enough. Yeah, perhaps, for, yeah. for example, when they were teaching me Sanskrit. Mm. Yeah, middle, no, okay, okay. So if it was that, it was okay. Because for us, you know, moral science used to be about uh, 
uh, western morality and ethics which we which i couldn't relate to given that you know i was i was brought up in a completely i was embedded in a completely different ecosystem that had nothing to do ah, with okay western okay. morality and all of those things so we, for us you know that is not something that i even today relate to so that's that's probably the reason why yeah so i think you have answered your own question in a way yeah there's a question on the chat i think which says uh, from from professor sharma which says please elaborate how learning e economics will make us global citizens so it doesn't make us global citizens we are already global citizens and uh, I, i think the the question is really about uh, why economics at all for uh, yeah say teenagers and and how does learning economics uh, you know make us more for example uh, relevant uh, in the world today so i think that's probably what the question is about one of the adults uh, who was attending our session along with their children you know when after the banking and finance uh, module they said oh i wish i only wish i knew this before and we asked him to elaborate and he said you know i work for uh, this uh, public sector undertaking um i brought my salary home spent it on essentials and the rest i parked it in a fixed deposit in a bank mm. and fixed deposit definitely is not a way to grow wealth um i asked them did did the inflation rate ever bother you they said no i said did the gross domestic product ever bother you they said no they i think anybody who uh, doesn't look at these economic indicators some of them are leading indicators others are lagging indicators if we are not looking at these items then we are hiding our head in the sand we did get by because there was no predator around but you could have been devastated the inflation rate could have say very uh, you know slowly and effectively eroded your wealth over time and you could have been with much less money uh, than you require at an older age um we are using um today in a globe we are, we are a globalized uh, planet um whatever happens in one part of the world can uh, very seriously affect it's outside the scope of this discussion but in a, in another discussion i'm quite happy to you know engage the audience in why we should be global citizens and why we should uh, keep economics as part of something that we keep tabs on yeah absolutely i i think i don't have a you know personally don't have a dispute with the fact that uh, economic because so if you could give I, some other example you know something better than i did mm. uh, that no, maybe i, I, I think, yeah i think for, i think at a very fundamental level uh, knowledge of economics is uh, crucial even to all aspects of life we'll be it personal e professional e economics is not like set theory right it affects our life directly okay. even that theory does <laughs> in a roundabout way but economics certainly does it's in our face okay. so we we have about uh, you know 10 minutes to go so I'll, i'll i'll bring you back to the communication skills workshops that you seem to you have you have a different way of working uh, on improving communication and you know it's something that was very novel when i when i came uh, when i came to know about it when i when you started doing it for us as well so I, i just want to know how did this because i also understand you know i've we've had conversations where you said you whichever organization that you went to i have also looked at the comments that are there with you know, everybody says that wherever amarnath goes he always he picks on a few people makes a small group and starts working on the communication skills so what is this about how how does it come about and, and how did you arrive at this kind of a communication model that you seem to build and uh, amish this is uh, actually very uh, the answer to this question is pretty close to my heart um it was the year 2004 um i just returned from singapore to take up a job in hyderabad and i was and it, this was a major telecom company and all our counterparts were you know in different parts of the world and so uh, they asked me to recruit a huge number of people our office was just yeah. setting up uh, and just uh, you might want to you know stop the share because i think it's blocking. yeah yeah okay Yeah. i i just thought i could uh, you right, know right. If people are interested yeah. i could uh, share this screen right for 5 minutes before i log off sure sure okay. yeah okay so um you know at that time i was intent on hiring people only from the metros hmm. 
thinking that they would make better team members than you know anywhere else uh, but we were a new organization we were new in india and we, we you know we could not compete with the biggies like infosys and tcs and cognizant and and our recruiters started going uh, you know uh, into rural areas to pick up uh, freshers from there and I, I didn't like that very much. And But at one point, there was one girl who said that they had a one-acre farm where they were growing peanuts and where they couldn't be sure that they would have a successful plantation year of crops, uh, year after year. And that uh, farmer had taken a risk, sold his land, put his girl in a hostel with tuition so that she would get into an engineering college and do a job. And then it was her job, her duty, to bring up the other two siblings. That story hit me hard. And I said, oh, no, this land belongs to them. This opportunity, this IT boom in their country, in their part of the world, it, it, they must benefit from it, not some distant fellow. And uh, there's a major change of uh, thinking there for me. And I started hiring them. Uh, you know, I started looking for um, some other attributes in them, and I would start hiring them. Okay, so they, one day they were all there and they couldn't speak English. They couldn't speak English to save their lives. They couldn't leave a message. They couldn't participate actively in a conference call. And I thought, uh, I've got them in, then what's next? So, uh, so I came upon this uh, news reading program that I had heard about, and I got them all into a room. And uh, you know, we are a consulting company, all our hours are billed. So I stole time from, half an hour from lunchtime, 15 minutes from the, you know, that time when they walk into the office. We use those 45 minutes effectively. And uh, I ran this program uh, month of, day upon day, month upon month, year upon year, till these guys, you know, got uh, across a certain uh, stage where they could uh, confidently speak with an overseas uh, colleague or partner, uh, leave a confident uh, voicemail message, and also write emails. Uh, that kick-started my interest in uh, teaching English or English communication skills through news reading. And for some time, I'd been very against, uh, you know, teaching grammar or even the nuances of English. So like saying P-U-T put and B-U-T but. I said, we should learn a language like we do in our mother's lap. That is by constantly hearing it and by extension, by constantly voicing it. Uh, that news reading program has been very successful. Uh, some of the, you know, people saw results uh, within four, six months. Um, and, and, they, and they came back with uh, feedback saying that the French couldn't believe it was them. Uh, this program has now turned to biography reading. And where there's a compound learning happening, uh, people read biographies of famous people. They read well-constructed sentences. They come across words uh, which uh, you know go into their vocabulary we use uh, chrome uh, google uh, dictionaries to learn how to pronounce them we learn their word forms their gra grammar aspects and then we have a, a double spaced uh, printout so they can easily use even the vernacular to specify how a certain word has to be pronounced we go through a rigorous uh, exercise we i recommend that they read it at least three uh, I have had people who have read it, exceeded that uh, by reading five or six times. Right now, we have a group of people in SVYM, the Future Teachers of India. They've shown tremendous progress. They were so struggling a month ago. Uh, and, and I see them reading fluently. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, so learning here has become compound for them. I, I love uh, designing compound learning programs. Uh, have I answered your question, Ramesh? Yes, yeah, but uh, yeah, the, the, the other part, the other part of the question was, uh, yeah, obviously, yeah, you said uh, it started because you wanted to uh, solve a problem, and then it's, it, but it's something that you've been doing at every say every every single organization that you've uh, gone to. So that is. Uh, I do it with my mother's uh, caretaker as well. All oh, right, the one who's com coming to your house right now, sir. Okay. <laughs> nobody safe. Nobody's safe from me. Right. And uh, so before I, you know, we wind this up, wind this down and other things, there's a one question that, uh, you know, I've, I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask in the right at the beginning, but I'll ask it now. Uh, you've talked of two failed entrepreneurial ventures. So I, I was just wondering, so what has that taught you? 
How, how was that? <laughs> oh, it taught me uh, quite a few things, my entrepreneurial ventures. Uh, right. My first right. entrepreneurial venture was actually a success. Mm. We did it at age 12. You know, our parents were not giving us money for buying sports goods. So we organized a fate and uh, we had food, we had games and we made enough money to buy a football and a partial cricket kit. Mm. So I was a cricket captain in those days uh, for my uh, area mm. and my friend was a football captain. So between us, we got this equipment. It's quite a success. Uh, years later, I think I failed to sell in my second entrepreneurial ven adult venture. Mm -hmm. And the second failure was because I was trying to sell where there was no market. Oh. So, um, if, if you want to go into business, get a mentor. Do not venture it alone. And get a partner. Get somebody to handle the commercial end of it, especially the sales end of it. Sales and marketing should be handled exclusively and the delivery exclusively again. Right. So, so sales and marketing was not really a cup, cup of tea. This is like... it, if I was looking at sales and marketing, hmm. delivery was suffering. Well, delivery was if I shifted my attention to delivery, this was suffering because both of them must happen continuously. And, and if, if, if I may ask, what, what was the, uh, was it a product or was it a service? It, it was a service. The, the second one which failed was a uh, hmm. It was also an ethical uh, dilemma for me. Um, and so I was happy to let it die. Um, it was a staff augmentation, uh, you know, around the year 2000. Um, nice. Staff augmentation business in the, uh, in the IT industry. Okay. Uh, the second one was uh, training people uh, for management. Here I did a lot of selling. I mm -hmm. went to Manila, I went to Taipei, I went to Indonesia, I, I was doing it in Singapore and Malaysia, too stretched. Uh, now, I would say, without going into the, uh, you know, all the details, I would say, get a mentor mm -hmm. and get a partner. Right. And the, and the partner can't be a mentor, the mentor can't be a partner. No, no. The mentor is totally <laughs> different. Somebody who's right. way down the line. And, and, and one of the wisdoms that I acquired out of this, this came out of my own mouth was it's better to be 50% partner of 1,000 rupee revenue mm. than 100% partner of a 100 rupee revenue. Right. right. I think so with that uh, life lesson, I think it's... Uh, I've, I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. I think there's also a chat here that from Amar who says, nice down-to-earth conversation, very practical. And My name's Sikh. Yeah. Uh, can you just stay long enough? Uh, because I haven't had a chance to re, uh, read the comments at all. I was so right. focused on what I was saying. Okay. Do they watch TV programs, sir? I would say certainly watch the new uh, the news uh, the news section. On you, you, would you say Doordarshan because only Doordarshan has news now. Rest of it, the rest of them have only views. <laughs> <laughs> we had stalwarts when I was right. growing up. Stalwart news readers, amazing news readers. Right. So, uh, so it's it's been an absolute pleasure, Mata. I think uh, we've had a, this conversation. We've. Uh, now, I think the pleasure is all mine, uh, Ramesh. I never had a whole hour somebody listening to me. <laughs> right. like, like, and, and this also brings another great uh, quote from Stephen Covey he said uh, first listen or seek to understand and then to be understood mm. I seek think this first. is one of the greatest secrets of communication mm. skills always listen first we, we are so eager to jump up you know, while the other person is uh, not even finished what they have to say we are thinking of rejoinders and counters. Yeah, and you're more interested in counters than being sympathetic uh, with the with the other party. That's also point. Uh, you know, one of, one of the points of these conversations that we that we take our time over the sixty minutes and not just you know, rush through so many questions. Uh, do something because the maximum number of questions I've asked is you know probably seven or eight in, in most of the conversations. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Next uh, next week, uh, again, we will at the same time, 
same place we would have uh, another conversation please do join us and next time you next week we will be talking about uh, the nrlm the national rural livelihood mission and uh, we would have a speaker who will come and share her thoughts with us and uh, so look forward to joining you it's it's this would be available on youtube as well and i'll share the link with all of them so once again on behalf of the swami vivekananda youth movement on behalf of vivekananda institute for leadership education and development I want to thank amar as well as thank all of you who have come here have a great weekend and thank you and bye bye